A first shout out to Rod Juan and his team for putting this conference together. Um, it's a huge honor and privilege for me to introduce Trita Parsi today. When I was at the University of Denver, we hosted Trita, I think, three or four times. And every time he came, he hit a home run. And I'm certain he's going to do so once again this afternoon. Uh, Trita is an award-winning author and the 2010 recipient of the Graw Mayer Award for Ideas on Improving World Order. He's an expert on U.S.-Iran relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East, with a particular focus on Iran and Israel. He was named by the Washingtonian Magazine as one of the 25 most influential voices on foreign policy uh, in Washington, D.C. in both 2021 and 2022 and uh, the preeminent public intellectual and American dissident has called Trita Parsi, uh, I mean, I'm referring to Noam Chomsky, he called Trita Parsi, quote, one of the most distinguished scholars on Iran. Currently, he's the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute in Washington, DC. He's published in all of the major publications. Um, he's frequently on television. Um, he speaks fluent Farsi and Swedish and, of course, English, and giving the rising tensions that we've seen over the last few days between Iran and Israel that flows out of the Gaza crisis. I can't think of a better person to speak to us at this moment about what's happening in the region. The title of his talk is called Biden, Gaza, and the End of the Rules-Based Order. Please join me in welcoming Trita Parsi to our conference. Thank you so much, Nader. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure and honor to be here. I just wish Nader had not raised your expectations as much as he did. I um, want to thank Nader, Radwan, Dalia, and everyone else who has been part of organizing this excellent conference um, and the excellent work that CSID is doing. My conversation here with you today will shift things a little bit compared to the previous conversation to not only the situation uh, in Gaza, but also uh, its role and impact in the broader shifts that are taking place globally. As you all know, the conversation on Gaza and the landscape on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has shifted tremendously just in the uh, course of the last couple of years. And there's many factors as to why we see a shift particularly here in the United States, that I think perhaps has taken many of us by surprise. Of course, you have the social media angle that allows people to circumvent the filter that New York Times has put on its coverage of the situation there and let people see exactly what is taking place right on their phones. We have also what some call the, um, well, let me take a step back. A couple of years ago, we had the George Floyd incidents here in the United States, and it ended up becoming a formative experience for a lot of young people. And Gaza, in many ways, has become the international version of that George Floyd experience, in which they are increasingly looking at what is happening in Gaza, not from the lens of terrorism, which has been the dominant frame in the United States of understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but from the lens of colonialism or decolonialism, from the lens of occupation. Um, and all of these things are, of course, very, very important, but there's also another fact that I think is very important, and that has oftentimes been overlooked, which is that this is all happening at the same time as there is a major shift in global power that is taking place. Global South countries or global majority countries are now at a level of influence or m reaching a level of influence in the international system that is bringing us back to the era prior to colonization. Just take a look at South Africa's application at the International Court of Justice. The first time a global South country is using or, or um, uh, utilizing these international institutions to put on trial a country aligned with the West rather than seeing these institutions consistently being used against countries in the global South. It is also incidentally during this very same period that we suddenly hear the term rules-based international order being very frequently used. Though it was coined by Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd towards the end of the 2000s and it was originally designed to hold China to a set of rules and norms and laws in the South China Sea. It has since morphed into a, a very different concept with a much more 
uh, unclear and at times deliberately unclear meaning and implications. The use of the term exploded after 2015, but it is not until the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine that you start seeing US officials starting to use that term almost in a compulsive manner. The Ukraine war was framed by the West not as a matter of sovereignty, not as a matter of violation of international law, as it was primarily, as Biden put it in his speech in March 2022, a great battle for freedom, a battle between democracy and autocracy, between liberty and repression, and here I emphasize, between a rules-based order and one governed by brute force. As effective as this framing was to a Western audience, allowed a great sense of moral rights, it fell almost completely flat amongst the global majority. And this is not terribly surprising, because to their ears, the rules-based international order sounded as nothing else but American exceptionalism and the double standards that the United States have been able to uh, get away with in the international system. The rules the US now, at this moment, treated as sacrosanct. Washington itself had, of course, violated systematically and continues to do so on a relatively large scale. Now, this doesn't, of course, mean that these global South countries in any way, shape, or form sided with Russia. On the contrary, it was very clear that the vast majority of them view this as an illegal and a blatant violation of international law. But they were not going to make any sacrifices, costly sacrifices, to uphold a system um, uh, in which America def an American-defined rule system that allowed the United States to put itself above all rules while selectively applying those rules to America's geopolitical rivals. Here is important to really start understanding what is the difference and what is the relationship between the rules-based international order and international law. While in the rhetoric that we have heard from particularly Biden officials, it is treated as if it is the same thing. It is treated as if it is, we we're referring to the international order since World War II. This is broadly rejected by countries outside of the West. These critics contend that the interpretation and the enforcement of its rules are a prerogative of Western powers superseding international law and encapsulating the notion of might makes right. Unlike international law, which of course has a process of how it is being adopted, it is adopted with the participation of countries and their own consent by signing treaties, the rules-based order, the rules within them are essentially set by Western powers with or without the consent of other countries, particularly those in the global south. This is part of the reason why in the United States we have increasingly started to refer to the rules-based order instead of international law. The latter is designed to bind the US and everyone else equally to uh, laws and rules, while the second one is um, uh, whereas the RBIO is increasingly becoming an American instrument in the views of many in opposition to international law. As John Dugard, professor of international law and a member of the legal team of South Africa filing the application against Israel at the International Court of Justice wrote, the rules-based international order may be seen as the United States' alternative to international law an order that encapsulates international law as interpreted by the United States to accord with its national interest, meaning whatever the US and its followers want it to mean at any given time. Let's take a look at what the Biden administration, how it described the rules-based international order in the 2021 national security strategy. And I quote, the United States will support and strengthen partnerships with countries that subscribe to the rules-based international order, and we will make sure those countries can defend themselves against foreign th threats. So as you see here, and I'm gonna read this again, because it's really important. The United States will support and strengthen partnership with countries that subscribe to the rules-based international order, and we will make sure that those countries can defend themselves against foreign threats. This is not how you describe an international governing structure. This is more a description of a block. A block 
in which you are treated preferentially, the laws do not apply to you if you are in conflict with another country that is not in the bloc, because it's based on who subscribes to this order and who doesn't. This suggests that Washington's response to the shift away from unipolarity, the shift towards multipolarity, is to deliberately erode international law and institutions and help birth a multi-order world. Unlike the Cold War, in which even with the existence of two blocs on the international uh, uh, stage, there was nevertheless an overarching unified global order where international law was still accepted as applying to all, although, of course, riddled with double standard, this new version is a multi-order world which would be one with different orders, with different principles, applying within them and, more importantly, between them. A simpler way of describing this would be perhaps a world with neither clear rules nor clear laws. Now, this has all been happening, and then suddenly you had Gaza. We ran the numbers, and it was quite fascinating to see the extent to which the term rules-based international order was consistently, frequently, almost compulsively used by the, uh, by the Biden administration. But between now and October 7th, there is not a single instance in which a principal Biden administration official has used the term rules-based international order in relation to Gaza. In fact, the general use of the term has gone down and it's only been used in relationship to, again, Ukraine, but not at all to Gaza. To some extent, this is quite understandable because the degree of the double standard would be simply too much for people to be able to stomach. But here you then have a situation in which we've seen not only that the United States violated, or, or vetoed, sorry, three UN resolutions with varying degrees of calls for a ceasefire or a humanitarian pause, and the last one that was allowed to pass because of an American abstention, the Biden administration immediately turned around and undermined by then declaring quite incorrectly that the UN Security Council resolution is non-binding. This fits in exactly with the pattern. This is part of the reason why it infuriated the other states in the council so much, because it's not just an undermining of that specific resolution. It's the undermining of the entire UN Security Council and the international order that is embodied in the UN system. Completely compatible with an effort to move away from the existing system towards a multi-order world in which you have a rules-based order for those who are aligning themselves with the West and as a result, like the United States, can put themselves above all rules. The reason why, in my view, the situation in Gaza has galvanized people around the world, particularly in the global south, the global majority, is not just because the issue of Palestine or, or the justness of the Palestinian cause or the suffering of the Palestinian people or the genocide that is taking place. Those are, of course, extremely, extremely important. I'm trying to belittle those. But it's also because the issue of Palestine the issue of what is happening in Gaza right now is embodying and symbolizing everything the global majority has found unfair and problematic with the rules-based inter international order. The double standards, the exceptions for the United States and Israel, the second-class status of global majority countries and those who do not subscribe to the rules-based international order. Today, the Palestinian cause symbolizes not just the struggle for Palestinian dignity, but also the struggle for the dignity of the global majority. It encapsulates every reason as to why there is a desire for a reinvigorated global order based on the universal and equal application of international law. And it's important to emphasize this. The alternative to the uh, rules-based order is not lawlessness, it's actually international law universally and equally applied to all countries. So this is uh, reinvigorating, uh, is encapsulating the sense that they rather have this than a transition to so-called rules-based international order that codifies the superiority of certain states over others. This is why in my estimation, 
the energy <clears throat> around the Palestinian cause, what is happening in Gaza, is not likely to dissipate because it is now one with a broader and completely inescapable struggle to define the post-unipolar American order. That is something that is going to happen. And as a result, uh, I think that the energy that we're seeing uh, around the uh, issue of Gaza and Palestine is not going to be uh, an exception in the manner that I think Washington has treated it, and certainly in the manner in which the Biden administration had thought that American voters are going to be treating it. I'll stop there. Thank you so much.